I want to welcome you this morning, and I know Nathan already did that, but uh, just want to say it's good to have you with us. Again, if it's your first time, I just want to say uh, it's an honor to have you with us today. Thank you for, for visiting, and I do want to reiterate, not just to repeat, but if you would, there's a little card that says welcome. Fill that out. Take it to Connect Center. We used to have a small gift, just our way of saying thank you, and uh, um, it's a gift that I know I would want, so hopefully it's something you would, uh, would like and enjoy as well, but you know, hey, we all got different interests. You know, I don't know if anybody has had this thought, but this morning, and this is not at all related to the sermon, so this is just free information, um, but uh, I looked in the mirror, and have you ever looked in the mirror and thought, I, I, I'm old? <laughs> anybody? And my mind went back, I thought, it's 2024 tomorrow, and I thought, man, how many remember the, the Y2K? Some of you younger ones are like, what's Y2K? Um, and I thought, I started doing the math, and I was like, I was in my 20s. <laughs> and I looked in the mirror, and I'm like, wow, 24 years went fast. I don't know if anybody's ever had those kind of thoughts. Um, I do not have for you this morning a New Year's sermon. Um, I mentioned last week, and we've just come out of talking about the, the, the gifts that the wise men brought to Jesus and, and how they have spiritual and both physical application, even for us today, and, and what all of those things meant. But um, I mentioned I was going to start talking about the kingdom. And, and I think today that as, as we begin to approach that subject here, um, there's a lot involved in the kingdom. Because that word in scripture has a lot of meaning to it. And I think in the church we have sometimes watered that down to just an idea that, well, because how many know Matthew says the kingdom of heaven a lot? And we think of heaven as this place where I'm going to go if I know Jesus when I die. But Matthew means a lot more than just that when he talks about the kingdom of of heaven, as well as other writers in scripture. And so I want to begin to tackle that this morning. And let me just say this, I'm going to read a lot of verses. And so it's going to be a little different than usual. Um, it, it, I don't want it to feel like I'm teaching. I want it to feel like I'm, I'm sharing and preaching. But um, if I feel like it's starting to be too much teaching, I'll just start yelling or something and, and we'll go back to preaching. I don't know. Um, but it's a lot more scripture than usual. Um, but if, I want to ask if you just kind of hang with me on this because I'm wanting to lay a foundation today that we can build on over the next several weeks because um, I really think the Lord wants us to get a grasp of what the kingdom of God means. Yeah. I think it's important. And so I want to begin this morning by talking about the kingdom is near. Those aren't my words. Those are actually the words of Jesus. And in Matthew 4, 17, it says this, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. We read those kind of things, and, and we get a little bit confused sometimes, or we want to try to narrow the focus down to like one thing, or, or just kind of like, I, I want something I can hang my hat on, right? Right? But it's a broad meaning, and, and I don't know if you've noticed this, but the world we live in is broken. How many know things don't work the way they're supposed to work? They don't work the way God created it to work, and so things just don't function the way they're supposed to. You know, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but all this automatic stuff, and, and this is a pretty silly illustration, but how many have ever went to the, you know, you, well, you're washing your hands after going to the restroom, Right? because we always do that, and, and you put your hand under those automatic things, yeah. or you got the hand blowers, and you end up just doing this, right? And I know that's silly, but it is a microcosm of us interacting with a broken world. Yeah. Things don't work the way they're supposed to, but bigger picture People don't work the way they're supposed to either. We do dumb stuff. 
when my wife and I were pastoring years ago in a small town north of here, very small town, and, and, and we were living in, in, in this house, and there was these retaining walls down by the driveway, and, and the, the height of the retaining wall was probably nine feet or so. And one of my sons, it was my youngest, I believe, thought it would be a good idea to ramp his bike off of that retaining wall. I was outside. I don't know why I didn't stop it. I don't remember the, all the details. I just remember he was scuffed from here to here. I mean, scratched and blood, and we checked him out, and he was fine, just scuffed up. But again, it's a microcosm of us as broken people. We do dumb stuff, and we get bloodied up for it. But the problem is, is we do dumb stuff that bloodies us up, not just physically, but emotionally, relationally, spiritually, and we get bloodied up and we get beat up. And a lot of this dumb stuff we do, which causes damage to ourselves and the world around us, the Bible calls it sin. Can we just admit that, right? Because the Bible tells us in Romans, we're going to read, it says, None of us are righteous, right? Not one of us. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so we, we sin, we do dumb stuff, and we get bloodied and we get beat up from it. And so from the beginning, the Bible ties our brokenness together with the brokenness of the world. See, in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve sin, and then it tells us this in Genesis 3.17. Cursed is the ground because of you, through painful toil, you will eat fruit, food from it all the days of your life. How many know this isn't how God created it? This isn't how it's supposed to be, but because Adam and Eve sinned, it brought in decay, right? It brought in all these things, and, and including us that don't work the way it's supposed to. But most of the time, when we try to fix things, how many know we aren't helping? We're just making things worse because we can't fix it. If you think or you have any inclination or idea that you can fix it, I can't fix it. You can't fix it, but the Bible is simply the story of God working to fix this broken world. So at the beginning of Matthew, Jesus is born. And we read in Matthew 1.23, it says, The virgin, Mary, will conceive and give birth to a son, that's Jesus, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us, right? And if you look just two verses earlier in Matthew 1.21, it says, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will what? Save his people from their sins. So when we read scripture, it is just this effort by God. And when I say effort, it's not like he, he, he was in scramble mode, right? But it was this decision by God that he's laying out this plan to fix the broken world that we live in. Matthew frames the first phase of Jesus' ministry with identical words, and I'm not going to read necessarily both verses to you, but in Matthew 4.23 and in 9.35, it tells us that Jesus went through Galilee, and then in 9.35, it says all the cities and villages, but here's where they say the same thing. Teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and Affliction. Chapters 8 and 9 show him healing every disease, every affliction. And in these miracles, Jesus is taking a part of the world that isn't the way it's supposed to be, and he says, I'm going to fix that. I'm going to fix that. This is broken. I'm going to fix it. This needs healing. I'm going to heal it. This needs restored. I'm going to restore it. How many know that that is what the kingdom does? Amen? Chapters 5 through 7, and, and we're going to be spending time in the coming weeks there on the Sermon on the Mount. This is where this is kind of coming from. But it illustrates that Jesus, as it says, he's teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. And as Matthew presents it, 
The purpose of the Sermon on the Mount is to summarize Jesus' message. So in his sermon, Jesus is dealing with broken people. Now here's the funny thing. When we read the Sermon on the Mount, I don't know if anybody's ever read that and thought, that's not me, right? But Jesus isn't saying in that sermon, hey, I want you to be one of those people What Jesus is saying is if you will enter into my kingdom and you'll let me lead you, that is the kind of person you'll become. See, we read that stuff and we think, man, I don't measure up. Well, of course you don't. Neither do I. None of us do. For we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Jesus says if you'll let me enter into your life and you become a part of the kingdom of God... This is the kind of person you'll become. And that's the heart of Christ. That's where he comes in and he says, I can fix some of the brokenness that's in this world if you'll just live for me and obey me. So the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus inviting people into life the way it was meant to be. Does that make sense? It's a broken world, but he invites us into life the way it was meant to be. So I want to share with you three ways from the sermon, from, from this passage, three ways of expressing what this life is. Number one is this. This life is called the kingdom. If you're a follower of Christ, this life is called the kingdom. And I want you to understand, you're like, okay, I don't get that. Well, hopefully we'll break it down. Jesus' one sentence summary of his message, we already read it in Matthew 4, 17, says this. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has what? Come near. In the Sermon on the Mount, he tells us in Matthew 6, 33, he says very clearly, what? Seek first his kingdom, and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. How many of we flip that, right? We seek a lot of things. We seek a lot of stuff, and we're like, God, give me stuff. Please bless it. God says, no, seek my kingdom. I'll give you the things. But the difference is, is when I give you the things, it means you're ready for those things, and I can bless them. Right? Right? So he's saying, seek first my kingdom. Many of us, we first start talking to our kids about heaven when a relative dies, right? Where's grandma? Well, she's she's in heaven. And we boil heaven down to just this place and a destination where we go when we die. It's true, but the New Testament almost never uses the word heaven that way. Like most words, heaven has a wide range of meaning. And so for people in New Testament times, heaven was, first of all, a place where the birds fly. In Matthew 6, 26, it's translated the air, right? The word heavens. Second, it's the place where the stars are. In Hebrews 11, 12, it's translated as the sky. But third, and you can read it in Matthew 6, 9, it's the place where God is. So that's probably what Paul meant when he talks about the third heaven. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, and I told you I was going to have more verses than usual today, but I want to read this one to you. At the very beginning of that verse, Paul writes, he says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to what? The third heaven. What does he mean? He means not the place where the birds are, not the place where the stars are, but the place where God is. The place where God is, and this is the heaven of the kingdom of heaven. The place where God is, where God rules, and where everything is the way it should be. But Matthew 6.10 turns that idea on its head. So let me confuse you. Here's what it says in Matthew 6.10. Your kingdom come, your will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven. 
So let me say this to you. When we talk about the kingdom of heaven, how many understand now that God is not just saying it's this place where you go when you die, but I want heaven to come to earth and it happens when my people obey me and when my people live for me the way that I design them to live. I will fix what's broken and I will restore things to you, but you've got to let me do it. Because Matthew says, your kingdom come, your will be done here as it is in heaven. Too many times we're content to say, well, I just hope I make it to heaven. <laughs> right? Man, that is obviously the ultimate goal. But there's a whole lot of blessing. There's a whole lot of power. There's a whole lot of, 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 of change that God wants to do in our life between now and the day we take our last breath and go to heaven. But we want to reduce it down to, well, the kingdom of heaven is when I die, I don't have to go to hell. I get to go to heaven. And man, there's so much more than that. Matthew says the kingdom can be here on earth as it is in heaven. It's not just a future place. It's a present layer of reality that has to be revealed. Like when Stephen saw in Acts chapter 7, I think it's verse 56, he saw the Son of God standing at the right hand of the Father. And then we read in Luke chapter 11, verse 20, and Jesus' miracles show this kingdom breaking in. Here's what he says in Luke eleven twenty. 20. He says, but if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So there is this understanding throughout scripture, this element that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and those are used interchangeably throughout scripture, is meant to be lived out here on this earth right? We have to have that understanding. It would be too much to say that the kingdom is here because the world is still broken, but it's also wrong to say the kingdom is not here. In Christ, it is available, it's accessible, it's breaking in. Theologians, and I even hate to say this because they use this phrase that the kingdom of heaven is now, but not yet. Meaning, we have it partially here, but not in its totality as it will be when we get to heaven. Jesus said it this way, the kingdom of heaven has come near. So we have to understand that there is a life that God wants us to live that far surpasses just hoping that we go to heaven when we die. And this is unabashedly and unashamedly supernatural. It's a different worldview that says that the world we see is broken and passing away, but there is a supernatural reality that is not broken. The question is, is it really a reality for you? Do you believe that? Is all this talk about the kingdom just some religious, good-sounding words? Or in Christ is there power to take what is old and make it new? Is there? All I know is over the last couple years as we prayed, we've seen multiple people healed of cancer. What was being destroyed and destructive, God made new. We've seen other diseases healed. We've seen God bring restoration and what was being destroyed by the enemy. God says, I'm going to restore it and I'm going to make it new. That's the kingdom of heaven at work. This life is called the kingdom. The second thing this life is called is righteousness. Matthew 6, says, seek first his kingdom and what? His righteousness. Righteousness. Again, when we talk about righteousness, it's kind of a complicated word that's used differently in different places. In Romans, Paul uses it in a way that, that kind of implies uh, uh, innocence in a courtroom. He talks about being declared righteous in Romans 2.13, but it's basically the judge pronouncing us not guilty. But how many know that nobody earns that? In Romans chapter 3, verse 10, it says, as it is written, how many are righteous? Nobody, not even one. Because why? We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Instead, in Romans 
It says this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Right? So we are declared righteous through our relationship with him. But outside of the court, courtroom, righteousness can also actually mean the way you live life. I'm not going to read it to you, but you can write it down. Look it up later. Genesis 6, 9 tells us that Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is thinking about righteousness as the way we actually live. In Matthew 6, 1, he talks about how it's something that we actually do. He says this, be careful not to practice your righteousness, what? In front of others to be seen by them. So how many of the righteousness has a behavior to it? Not just being declared righteous by God when we ask him into our heart, but now he's saying there's also a righteousness that can be lived out. How many are tracking with me? Again, it has multiple meanings. And there's others in Matthew 5. We cannot be saved from one way of life without being brought into a different way of life. You ever went to the doctor and you said something like, hey, it hurts when I do this. And he says something like, don't do that. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever had an experience similar to that, but we've known people who want to diagnose the problem but not help, right? Years ago, and Amy was having some health issues and some neurological stuff. She wasn't going crazy or anything, but um, <laughs> maybe, I don't know. And we went to the doctor and they diagnosed, but they didn't know how to help. And my question was kind of like, hey, um, what good does that do, right? I mean, we asked what was causing the problem. He gave some big medical term. And, and then we had to take that diagnosis to someone who could actually help. See, Jesus' sermon is calling us to actual changes in behavior. Action. Not just diagnosing the problem, because here's what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, not the amount, but Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount. That'd be a good tithing sermon. Yes. <laughs> Work on that. Um, no, in all seriousness, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says it's been said not to commit adultery. But then he says, eh, if you think lustfully, you've already done it in your heart, right? He says it's been said don't murder, but if you hold a grudge against someone and you're angry, then you've already done that in your heart, right? See, Jesus Sermon on the Mount, when we talk about, now I'm going to say that every time. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, when we talk about behavior, he's like, listen, there is a righteousness that I give you through the blood of Jesus Christ, but there's also a behavior, a lifestyle that I want to help you live that goes beyond just obeying the rules, amen? And he says this, and, well, let me say this to you, that will challenge us in every way we don't want to be challenged. But the question is, will we let it challenge us? Will we say, God, I want to live in your kingdom. I want to allow the kingdom of God to come to earth through me. Am I willing to live a level of righteousness that's going to facilitate that? But the third and final thing I want to share is this. This life is called Jesus. It's life in Christ. Hebrew poetry, and when we talk about, think about poetry, we, we like things that rhyme, right? When you read scripture and there's poetry written in scripture, it doesn't rhyme words. Rather, it, it rhymes ideas. It's one idea stated in two parallel ways. So Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 and 11 do this, and I want to read them to you real quick. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. There's that word. For theirs is the what? Kingdom of heaven. Which means if we're being persecuted, guess where we're not? Heaven. 
And if we're being persecuted for living like Christ, then the kingdom of heaven has an element here on earth, right? But verse 11 says this, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. See, they are blessed when they're persecuted because of Jesus. This righteousness, this life, the way it is meant to be lived out is through Jesus Christ. Everything is because of him. As Hebrew puts it in in, in Hebrews 2.14, that Jesus shared in their humanity He was made fully human. Hebrews 2.17, it says this, For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way. So Jesus comes and he's fully human and he shows us what a person who isn't broken looks like. That's why he came. He said, I want to show you and I'm going to give my life so that you can. But it's not that Jesus just shows us what life the way it was meant to be looks like. He is life. In John 1, 4, it tells us this. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The phrase that Paul repeats over and over is that we are in Christ. This life is called the kingdom. It's called righteousness, and it's called Christ. And again, there is something unashamedly supernatural here. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, and we know the verse, that if anyone is what? In Christ. What happens? The new creation has come, the old is gone, and the new is here. See, this life is supposed to be lived in Christ. And while our body and our flesh is still part of the old broken world in Christ, our spirit is not broken, our hearts have been made new. See, the problem is, is we make choices that bloody us up emotionally, spiritually, relationally. And God wants to set us free and he wants to deliver us from that. And he says, I want to renew that. I want the kingdom of heaven to come to earth. And and, and what's broken, he says, I want to fix. And we're like, "Mm, no. See, in John chapter five, and I'm going to close with this. There's this gentleman who's been basically crippled for 38 years. And Jesus asked him a strange question. I'm going to read it to you in just a minute. But this man, if you know the story, you probably have read it, but he's laying by the pool of Bethesda, right? And they had a belief that occasionally the waters would be stirred and they had this belief that the first person in would be healed because they thought it was an angel stirring the waters. It was not, but that's what they thought. Well, Jesus walks up to this guy who's been crippled for 38 years in John chapter 5, verse 6. Here's what he says. He just walks up to him. He says, do you want to be healed? Now, you can go read the rest of that story. I'm not going to read it all to you, but... If you notice, if you read on, he doesn't answer that question. He begins to say, well, I'm crippled and I don't have anyone to put me in the water when the water's stirred. Somebody always gets in before me and so here I am. Jesus asked him, do you want to be well? How many know that's a yes or no question? But instead of yes or no, he gives an excuse as to why he's still 38 years later laying on a mat and can't walk and can't do anything. And he begins to explain to Jesus how it's not possible. For some people, and maybe some of you even in this room today, brokenness has become a part of who you are. It may hurt, but it feels normal. And Jesus looks at us and he says, Do you want to be well? Well, you know, Jesus, I had a rough childhood. And I've been abused. And I I just don't know. Just like, I asked you if you want to be well. Well, you know, I, I, I just got so much anger and so much bitterness. 
but it feels normal and it feels comfortable. And we're just like, well, I've learned how to function this way so it feels safe. Jesus says, you still haven't answered my question. Do you want to be well? Well, you know, I, I don't know if anybody's ever witnessed this, but I have. I know my wife and I have. Someone that's in an abusive relationship. And they just keep going back to it. And, you, and in your mind, you're like, you know they're going to end up in the emergency room. And sure enough, what happens? They end up in the emergency room. And you look at them and you're like, man, I wish normal could feel normal for you. Right? Here's the deal. We are better at diagnosing someone else's abnormality than we are our own. We look at our own life because we know what we've been through and we get to make these excuses and we're like, well, God, if I give that up, then I just don't really know how I'm going to feel safe because I've wrapped myself in this cloak of anger or this cloak of bitterness or this cloak of, 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 of being a victim and, and feeling like... Jesus says, I know all that. Do you want to be healed? Read the story in John 5. And despite his answer, if you know what happens, what does Jesus do? He heals them. He says, get up and walk. So I want to ask you today, Do you want to be healed? Do you want what's broken? Do you want the kingdom of God to sweep in and fix what's broken? Do you want to heal your heart? Heal your emotions? Heal your relationship? Maybe heal your body. I don't know. We haven't talked about what all that actually looks like. The details of life as it's supposed to be, or what the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is about. But before we even start, you got to ask yourself, are you tired enough of this broken life to consider something new? Can I even wrap my mind around it enough to believe for something better? Because there's some, you've circled the same mountain hundreds of times. And you're like, God, I don't even want to get my hopes up again. But can I tell you, in your own strength, you'll never conquer that. But when you say, God, I want your kingdom, I want your power, I want your spirit to flood in, things change. I'm going to say one more thing. and I wouldn't plan on going here, but we know the story when the Israelites crossed the Jordan River and they were going into the Jericho to take the land that God had given them, right? They get to Jericho, and we know the story. How many know the walls of Jericho were huge, right? Formidable, so big, so, so wide. If you don't know that they would drive chariots on top of that wall and large enough that they could actually... Two lanes, right? They can meet. I doubt they called it two lane at that time, but that's what we'll call it. And they stand there and they're like, what are we going to do? And God gives Joshua this plan. How many know by man's standards, Joshua's plan was stupid? I mean, you can't get a worse plan. We're going to walk around these walls one time a day for six days. On the seventh day, we're going to walk around it seven times. And then when we're done, we're going to shout really loud. If you were one of the people in that group, in that army, you would have been like, Joshua. Right? I mean, let's be honest. Some of you, you've walked around the same walls so many times. And here's the reality the 13th time they walked around those walls, nothing looked different than the first time. Those walls looked identical. And it wasn't until they shouted in obedience to God, 
that the walls actually fell. Now, see, I don't know what God's telling you, but what we end up doing is we're like, God, I've got this plan. I've got this idea on how to bring the mountain down that I've been walking around, and God's like, great. When you're done, let me know. I'm here to help. Right? And in essence, God's looking at you saying, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be restored? We're like, nope, I've got it. I've got it, God. He's like, okay. I'm, I'm here. And I think he asked this over and over again, but you've got to get tired of going around the same stinking walls. Tired enough that you say, I'm ready for something better. I'm ready for the kingdom to come into my life. I'm ready for, for Jesus to become the reality that my life is centered on. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? Amen. Bow your heads with me if you would. God, I just thank you for your faithfulness. And Lord, we read a lot of verses today and talked about a lot of things. But Lord, I pray that just as a simple takeaway, we understand that the kingdom of heaven, Lord, it's where we want to spend eternity, but Lord, you want it to be a part of our life now. God, that we would step back and be willing to say, God, I'm tired of circling the same stuff. I need your power. I need your kingdom. I need your healing. I need your restoration. And so, Lord, today I just ask that you would speak to each one of us by your spirit. God, in just real and tangible ways that, God, we would know that it's you that is speaking to us. Not my words, not anyone else's, but, Lord, you're the only one by your spirit. God, that can minister and touch and talk to each one in a given moment. So Lord, we need you. And Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, with your heads bowed and eyes closed for just a moment this morning, just a couple of things that I think God is wanting us to give opportunity for number one is you say, Steve, I'm, I'm here and I don't know Jesus as my personal Savior. We read it in Romans that we've all sinned, we've all fallen short of the glory of God, there's no one righteous. But we also know that Scripture tells us in Romans, and he says, if you confess your sins and believe in your heart that Christ was raised from the dead, that you will be saved. And so this morning, if you've never asked him in your heart, or maybe you have, and, and you walked away from it, but this morning you would say, I, I'm here, and I do not have that living relationship with Jesus Christ. If that's you, I want to ask you if you would, just right at your seat, if you just slip up your hand. Just slip it up, put it right back down, just quick enough so we can see it. Thank you, I see that one. Anyone else? Would you say, man, I want to ask Jesus into my heart, into my life. New beginning, new start. Thank you, I see that one. Anyone else this morning as God's spirit speaks to you? Any others before we pray? Amen. Second thing I want to ask is this. Is you'd say, man, I've been circling the same walls. And Jesus is asking me, do you want to be well. Will you let me fix it? Will you let me bring wholeness where there's brokenness? And for far too long, you would even say, I have been saying, no, I've got this. And today you are willing to say, Jesus, I need the kingdom of heaven to come now into my life, that the power of the risen Savior will move the mountain, will knock down the walls. It's the only way to win the battle, guys. If that's you this morning, I want to ask you the same thing. 
you just slip up your hand. Just thank you for that one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see those. Amen. Thank you. I see that. Anyone else? Thank you. God has an answer. And I would even go beyond that and say, God, through Jesus, is the answer. But you've got to let him in. You got to let him in and trust him. I want to ask this morning if our prayer team would come. Listen, there is nothing supernatural about this area up here at the front. And there's nothing supernatural about us standing up here but I'll tell you what is is when we take a step towards Jesus he will close the rest of that gap and he will come to you and he will give you direction and he will give you guidance and he will begin to speak to your heart and he'll begin to say turn here or go here or go this direction and he will begin to make walls fall that you've been walking around for a very long time. If you take a step towards him. As Amy leads us, if you slipped up your hand, even if you didn't, we just want to pray with you. We're just going to believe God that he is going to start moving on your behalf as you say, God, it's not mine, it's yours. And I'm going to trust you with it. Amen. Let's worship as Amy leads. And if you slipped up your hand or even if you didn't, would you come and just allow us to pray with you this morning? We just want to agree with you in prayer.